All right, we wanted to review the state of the media writ large oh. um, with a great friend of us and new friend of Breaking right. Points, I would say, the one and only Glenn Greenwald. He's, of course, co-founding editor of The Intercept. Um, he has a fantastic substack that you're probably already subscribed to, but if you're not, you should do that. He's also author of a new book called Securing Democracy, Pulitzer Prize winner, blah, blah, blah. Great to see you, Glenn. Good to see you, Glenn. Great to be with you guys. Congratulations on the success of... The new launch. I'm super happy for you and super happy to Thank participate. You. Well, Thank it's you. awesome. Yeah. And as, as usual, you have like an idyllic background, which makes us jealous of where <laughs> we currently are. Actually, this is the first yeah. day that well, I'm not jealous. I knew you guys, I knew you guys spent a lot too. of time on your background. We're all proud of it. So I just wanted to make you feel a little less proud of <laughs> right, what yeah. you had accomplished. <laughs> Take us down a notch, that's uh, what he does. Glenn, that's what you do. He doesn't just do it for us, though. He does it for the entire media. So yes. we have to start with this one, Glenn. You flagged this. Uh, I just thought it was incredible. CNN's Brian Stelter yesterday on his show. Precious time with the American press secretary. This is what he chose to ask her. Let's take a listen. Jen, thanks for coming on Reliable Sources. My pleasure. Busy summer ahead, infrastructure, election reform. What does the press get wrong? when covering Biden's agenda. When you watch the news, when you read the news, what do you think we get wrong? Well, look, I think some of our muscles have atrophied a little bit over the last few years, and there isn't a, a lot of memory, a recent memory or long, longer memory on how long it takes to get legislation forward. I don't even know where to begin with that one, Glenn. H how does one ask a question like that to the American press secretary? Well, first of all, I think it's important that any video that contains any clips from that interview have an adults only designation <laughs> on it because it's really not appropriate or suitable for anyone under 18. And the amazing thing is, Sagar, that as bad as that opening question was, I mean, the opening question that he had was basically, Jen, tell us what we do wrong. How can we better serve you? What, is, what can we do better for you? It actually descended from there it got more sycophantic you know he asked her one of the most interesting parts was he asked her you have you know a seven-year-old daughter which is already kind of creepy that he knows that that's at the forefront of his brain he's like i have a kindergartner so he's trying to like establish this personal relationship with her and he's like do you worry about the world the future of the world given that the republican party is so evil and she was like uncomfortable with that question because it was just too adoring and she actually went out of her way to say i don't really see the world democrat versus republican like you brian stelter the pretend journalist do so the white house press secretary was telling him that he was being too partisan and politicized in how he views the world and i think what this really shows is over the last five years cnn has transformed from an organization that used to pretend to be neutral and that in some ways did try to be into one that has just completely given up the pretense to the point where you now have a CNN host who has seven or eight minutes with the spokesperson of nominally the world's most powerful politician and refuses to ask her a single difficult question about any of the things the government is or is not doing, but instead is just desperate to become her best friend in a way that's so obvious it's actually uncomfortable to watch. I mean, this has been great for ratings, right, Glenn? I mean, they're doing fabulously in the Biden era, aren't they? Well, that's the other thing is, you know, I think people have forgotten that in 2014 and 2015, especially MSNBC, but also CNN, there were constant articles about how Phil Griffin, the president of MSNBC, wanted to fire basically everybody who was on the air except for Rachel Maddow, in part because the idea of turning MSNBC into a organ of the Democratic Party was starting to jeopardize the NBC News brand because so many NBC News uh, journalists would appear on MSNBC and get contaminated by this overt partisan ethos that had been created there. But also, obviously, more important to Phil Griffin, nobody was watching. Nobody was. I mean, the ratings were abysmal. They were all this close to getting fired. And the only person who came and saved them was Donald Trump. For four years, they induced enough mania and paranoia and psychosis in enough people to make their ratings sustainable, in fact, quite vibrant. But it was all based on this like artificial sugar high of that a lot of media organ organs fed on, which was scaring people enough about Trump to make them consume more news than they ordinarily would want to. And with him gone, 
it's like we've reverted back to 2015 where these people have nothing to offer. They all sound exactly alike. They're all upholding the same banal liberal orthodoxies. There's no independence. There's no dissidence. There's no deviation or from or questioning of orthodoxy. And how do you make people pay attention to what you're doing if all you're doing is just uphold status, upholding status quo pieties? Nobody is interested. And their ratings, uh, both MSNBC and CNN, are shockingly uh, collapsing. I mean, CNN in prime time can't even get close to a million viewers, a million overall viewers. 10% only of their audience is under 55. And even there, among people under 55, these primetime shows are getting like 100,000, 150,000 people watching, like a mid-level YouTuber gets more than that. And the same obviously ha is happening with digital liberal outlets, Huffington Post, BuzzFeed, Vice, Volter, Vox, TM. They're all the same, and therefore they're all disappearing and everything's consolidating with the New York Times and the Washington Post because if you don't offer anything unique, no one's gonna pay attention. It's stunning to me that they continue to go along with the strategy though, Glenn, because I thought that they would at least try to innovate, but you saw Stelter, one of my favorite stories we covered here is he actually got higher ratings on his show when he was on vacation and they actually dropped whenever he came back. And you're watching this happen all across the ecosystem and yet the reporting and the overall fawning over the democratic politicians and more, it doesn't change. Why, it, like how can they continue to go uh, on this road? Do they believe it? What are the structural incentives beyond, that we're not seeing? Yeah, so I think it's a few things. Um, first of all, if you train your audience to expect that you're only going to tell them what they want to hear, what is affirming of their worldview, and never challenge or question them in any way, you're essentially now captive to or imprisoned by your own audience. Um, I have a friend who, or a former friend, who is the host of a prominent MSNBC show, and that person once told me that they don't get show by show ratings, they get segment by segment ratings. And they said, if we put somebody on who's critical of the Democratic Party, you can watch in real time, the ratings collapse. People just don't wanna hear it, they switch channels. On top of that, they get attacked on social media, vilified by their own audience. Um, Brian Stelter asked one question that he claims made liberals angry, and I actually believe him, which is he asked Jen Psaki, why doesn't President Biden have more news conferences? And he claims that all of the liberals who watch CNN were attacking him for even asking one like mildly, I wouldn't even call it challenging, but just like a question that implied that maybe Joe Biden is not perfect. And this is what they've trained their audience to do. So if you're a cable host or if you're a cable executive and you see your audience vanishing, the last thing you want to do is to take the few remaining old people in nursing homes who are still watching and say things that might force even them to go away. It's a huge dilemma. It's like, do we stick to this failing strategy of feeding an ever-shrinking audience the partisan tripe that they want to hear? Or do we change course knowing we're going to alienate the few people who are still watching in the hope of trying to get something different? The problem is, where where is that something different going to come from? They, they, they are staffed with people who are now believers. I do believe, you asked me, Sagar, like, is this all cynical or is it true conviction? I believe that when you are in institutions long enough like this that subsume you in a certain political perspective, at some point you do start to actually believe that what you're saying is true because no human being wants to yeah. consciously believe that I'm saying something I don't really believe from material or careerist end. So I think part of it is also true conviction, which makes it even harder to get out of. Also, this mindset, and this is actually, so there's a big, like, Daily P Beast hit piece out on you, very lengthy, it's kind of all over the map, but there's one part of it that I found very revealing and that fits into this conversation, which is they're essentially accusing you of providing ammunition for Fox News. And they don't dispute that any of the things that you're talking about are legitimate critiques or, you know, that they got, you know, MSNBC and CNN got certain stories wrong that you were pointing out and then Fox News latches onto it and uses it for their own ends. But there's this ethos of like, you can't criticize the Democrats because you're giving ammunition to the bad guys. So we just have to stay silent, even if it's a legitimate knock. We just have to keep quiet because people who have nefarious um, ends in mind may use that in their own sort of propaganda and as a talking point. And I kind of understand the instinct, but it's the path to hell. Because the minute that you just sort of like blind spot everything that's a failing of your team, 
um, is the minute that no one trusts you anymore and there is no sort of like baseline truth factor principle left. So I found it really interesting that that was sort of like their main critique of you as how dare you say anything that's uncomfortable for the Democratic Party and that right wing actors might like. Yeah, I always find media criticisms of me or other people to be most revealing because in identifying the things that they think are incriminating about you, they're implicitly saying what they think the role of a journalist ought to be. So exactly as you said, by criticizing me for saying things that might find a favorable audience you know, on the right or among Fox News, they're essentially saying that a journalist should never report anything or say anything that in any way can undermine the Democratic Party or make the Republican Party stronger, even if what you're saying is true. And I really think this mentality has done more to corrupt modern journalism than any other. Uh, I think we see it most vividly in this incredible debacle that I know you guys have discussed before of how for an, an entire year, the liberal sectors of the U.S. media treated the question of COVID's origin as a settled question, that it clearly was zoonotic, jumping from animal to human, and that anyone who raised the question of whether it might have escaped from a lab was a deranged conspiracy theorist to the point where they ought to be banned from social media, when in fact that certainty was never warranted or even close to it. And now everyone's recognizing that they're both plausible theories, neither of which has yet been proven. And the question is, why would that happen? And the answer is because it was Trump who were the ones saying that maybe there was a lab leak. And so that mentality that you just described, which is never say anything that might help the Republican Party, led the media to endorse a view of the world that was totally false, namely that the question of COVID's origins had been resolved with finality, that there was conclusive evidence in support of the, of the zoonotic theory. It was the same thing with Russiagate. It doesn't matter if Russiagate is true or not. Saying that it's true helps the Democrats. Saying that it's not true or questioning whether it's it is helps the Republicans, and therefore the role of a journalist is to make sure you do everything possible not to help Donald Trump. That's the reason also why they didn't want to report on the Hunter Biden archive. It didn't matter if it was authentic. It didn't matter if it was in the public interest. All that mattered is that reporting on it would have helped the Democrats become weaker, and therefore the role of a journalist is to avoid anything that does that. And that absolutely is the prevailing mindset in most of these failing outlets. And it's not only making them fail because nobody trusts them, but it's also corrupting the role of journalism in a democracy, which is not to serve one party or the other, but to unearth the truth. Absolutely right, Glenn. We really appreciate it. Thank you for being our very first Breaking Points guest. We couldn't think of anybody better. We appreciate it, man. Appreciate you, Glenn. Thank you. Yeah, I couldn't I couldn't think of anybody better either. And um, <laughs> I think you guys did a great job. And, uh, you know, I'm a huge fan of both of you, so I'm wishing you huge luck. And I know you're not going to need it, but congratulations again. That Thank means you, a lot to us. Thank you, Glenn. Appreciate it. Thank you guys so much for watching our first Breaking Point show. Uh, we are so, so excited to be doing what we're doing here. It wouldn't be possible without Supercast, who we are 100% powered by for our premium subscriptions. If you want to become a premium member today, you get to say, number one, screw you to the corporate media. You get to help us support our work here. And in exchange, you get to watch the show completely uncut. You can listen to it as well, one hour early before everyone else. And we do weekly Q&As as well. We'll make sure you watch out for that coming at the end of the week. That's Link right, right there. Down down in the description. Go ahead and check it out. Um, we love you guys so much. Thank you for watching, and we will see you back here tomorrow.